proceedings are still on their way. Ansonsten, der nächste Vortrag ist Beeinflussung durch künstliche Intelligenz. Es ist ein Einführungsvortrag. The talk will be by Karen Ulrich and Hendrik Heuer. Karen works at the University of Amsterdam and Hendrik at the University of Bremen. Karen researches on machine learning and Hendrik is doing academic work on human-machine interaction in Bremen. Please give them a warm welcome. Yeah, vielen Dank. Moin erstmal. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome to our talk, how artificial intelligence is impacting our daily lives. We would like to start with a quote from Kate Crawford, the founder of the AI Now Institute. She is principal researcher at Microsoft and a professor at NYU in New York. And she once uh, said this year at a symposium that humans fear that that humans fear that computers are too intel too intelligent and will conquer the world but actually and that's what she says uh, computers are dumb and already have conquered the world so we would like now to draw on a couple of examples some of you might know them but we're basically aggregating them to to paint a bigger picture of the phenomenon. And why are we talking about banality of, um, of the approach? Because some of the systems that have been designed are actually pretty simple. And we'll see how they impact our lives during our talk. So, a couple of words about ourselves. Karn is researching at the University of Amsterdam uh, Bayesian method, methods and uh, deep learning at the University of Amsterdam. And I'm a research assistant at the University of uh, Bremen, and I'm focusing on human-machine interaction and especially trust issues. We would like to start with an example that most of you will know. Um, it's about detection of spam. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We would like to look at the technical setup behind it, which is actually a quite astonishing one. And the difference that we would like to talk about is imperative programming and machine learning. The first imperative programming is basically what everyone would think of first. It's imper imperative programming in a way that it's uh, very absolute. So if Viagra is written as here in a email, then it's a spam email. Otherwise, it's a good, uh, valid um, message. And machine learning is a different system of predicting. It's an iterative system, and we're looking to predict whether or not a email is a spam email. And this is done by looking at a lot of different examples and classifying them if they're spam or not. And this is being calculated with a resulting error. So if you actually change the parameters that led to this um, error calculation, you can also, of course, change the error and uh, minimize it, which is a, uh, an own field of research in itself. And after this, you go back to step one and can basically, in iterative circles, um, change the outcome of the process. So this is not as um, absolute as the algorithm doesn't have to, um, in this example, first need to uh, really detect whether or not something is spam or not, like in the imperative programming case. We're continuing now to um, medicine as a field and the detection of breast cancer. So we have different features 
that distinguish um, benign and malignant um, cases of breast cancer, separated by a couple of features, like curves, um, points. Um, so some examples are shown above. <laughs> so if you take two characteristics, for example, the number of points and uh, as the first one and the pixels as a second case, um, you can see that there's a separation, a line of separation um, indicated here in blue and red. So mathematically, you can basically draw a line through, through this um, data set and that's called a decision boundary. Doesn't need to be linear, uh, could be more complex, and usually it is more complex actually. So this approach is kind of an analog approach to what actually a doctor would do. They're learning and drawing on their experience and, and then decide whether or not something is benign or malignant. And the the big advantage, uh, advantage of machine learning is that we can draw on a huge set of examples and, and have a better um, line of distinction based on a huge number of examples. And you can also see that there are a lot of red cases uh, to the right of the picture. And uh, this means that very often we're actually making errors when predicting um, predicting breast cancer. And uh, very often that actually... So if I have people that, that I tell that they have a bad <laughs> breast cancer and that they actually have a benign breast cancer, they might be very stressed. Before we continue, we want to talk about the, the power of big data. And what we want to do here is to look at um, personality markers. Um, we use data that is very easily accessible, but it can be used to have very com to predict very complex personality markers. For this study, they had um, a lot of uh, voluntary pe volunteers that uh, gave their Facebook profile with all of the likes and all of the information, like their sexual interest or their religion. What the researchers did was to use a very simple model, a simple regression model, to predict, um, based on the likes, what personality markers could be detected. With an accuracy of 95%, you could detect whether somebody was uh, white or Afro-American. Um, the sexual interest could also be um, detected with a very high, very high accuracy. The political interest, the religion, and also the experience with drugs. Or um, the, the form of the family and the parents in the youth. Um, predicting the, the experience with drugs is not as easy as predicting um, your uh, gender or sexual interest. We show this because it gives a lot of um, possibilities of discriminating people. What we want to show here is that we have to think about um, privacy because you can detect a lot from just very simple data. Using this model, you can find likes that are very, very important for a specific personality marker. You can think about this for yourself, which of these pictures is related to the intelligence, which of them is um, 
more about the sexual interest. And the um, interesting thing is that this um, approach of looking at pictures and basically drawing conclusions about the personality features associated with them uh, is is um, kind of comparable to approaches that also companies like Google are approaching. So basically, we're using big data to detect humans and single persons. And this kind of research can also be used to, for example, identify people in a pool of voters that are more likely to be convinced to vote for your own party. And this also has been uh, uh, has been covered by the media in, in the general public in f running up to the German election, but also in the context of the Trump uh, election in the US. We think this is a very likely use case. And we've also seen that this has enabled kind of a discrimination 2.0 for example, if um, an employer can detect um, or predict whether or not a employee is homosexual or not and then draws his own conclusions. And this discrimination actually can, um, can be more concrete and we can see this in the legal system in the US where actually it is being predicted whether or not somebody will fall back and recommit basic a crime after being sentenced to, to jail. And here there is an uh, example. To the left there is a man, VP. He has done two, um, uh, two crimes, uh, robbing a, a store. And to the right there is a woman. She has committed four different cases as a uh, minor, uh, being less than 18 of age. So both of them, a category uh, is being allotted. To the left, there's th three low risk. To the right, there's eight high risk. And what actually happened in reality, what we're looking at is a prediction, remember that, is that the guy to the left immediately committed a new crime after being released and the woman to the right didn't. So in this case the prediction was wrong and also d discriminatory in a, in a way because the woman right is a woman of color. And we also know this from statistics. We're distinguishing this there uh, between type 1 and type 2 error. The type 1 error means that the person that is being predicted with a high risk is likely to um, commit a crime and type 2 means um, yeah. <laughs> uh, type, type 2 error is that a person is predicted with a low risk but actually does commit a new crime. Here the probability is the other way around. White, white people have, uh, have a higher chance of falling into this error than people of color. So how does this happen? We assume that those are uh, good programmers who have learned their stuff and know what they're doing. What you want to learn is a, um, a function that goes from X to Y. The problem is that X is not a sample from the population, but instead just the people that have seen by the police. So it's not representative. This could be a self-fulfilling prophecy because maybe um, <coughs> black people might just be checked more often and maybe that leads to a bias in the data set. On the other side, the prediction is also biased because it is based only on people who were processed by the legal system. So you also have a Y prime. 
dann kann auch dort If you have a jury in your legal system, then this discrimination might be more or less extreme, depending on the people. Mathematische Modelle zu einer Art Geldwäsche für Vorurteile. What you can do with machine learning is build a system that kind of hides this discrimination. So let's go back to taking direct influence. Those systems are sold as tools that can be used to help you in predicting crimes. But the problem is that the people that use these tools, they trust those algorithms. <laughs> There's another example from the Deutschlandfunk, mm, where uh, Veronika Heller, who was working for the legal system and was suggesting um, a punishment for the, for the uh, The problem is it's more about social things and not just about the machine learning because even if the system would be fair, it always means that the results must not be interpreted in a fair way. People might still make errors. And there are probably a lot of people here who build these systems. Um, the bias based on this data is everywhere. Um, this is an example from Google. We were searching for three white teenagers on the left, and on the right we were looking for three black teenagers. Um, technology shows societal problems. We have socio technological systems here that show a problem view but can also enforce them. There's another example here from statistical translation. Um, you have to know that the Turkish language does not uh, differentiate between different grammatical genders, uh, as German language would do. So if you then use Google Translate in this example and translate, um, he is uh, he's looking after children and she's a doctor, um, then the gender doesn't show up in the Turkish language. But when you translate it back, the gender was mixed around the other way. So the doctor was suddenly male and the babysitter was female. So what we do when we translate is we calculate probabilities and then just use the most probable result. So even very minor um, errors can be um, reinforced and then you get these problems that we've seen here. But this can be explained technologically, but but what what does this mean for the worldview that you get from using a, tr a translation service like this? Okay, our next example using Facebook shows how transparent or intransparent this uh, influence can be. Facebook is a very, very social system where users are both users that are consuming but also producing content. Uh, Facebook always wants to show the users relevant stuff and uses a lot of um, data. The um, in this example from this paper, people have 200 friends and like 80 pages. So if every third person does something, there are a potential of 90 posts. A chronological uh, view is not very useful. So Facebook is sorting the posts using an algorithm. The problem is that this process is very intransparent, so the users don't know and understand the algorithms, and they think that if you talk to them, that the algorithms are ob objective and uh, independent. And I'm talking about this study, which is from the computer interaction community, and 62.5% of the volunteers in the study did not know about this news curation. 
There were 40 volunteers and they are representative for the U.S. population. 25% did not even know that it was sorted at all. The users are also angry if they don't see posts from close friends and family members. The interesting part is that the volunteers are looking for the problem with themselves or other people, but not with the algorithm that Facebook uses. They think that their friends don't share stuff with them because they are not very close friends, they don't know each other very well. That's why we have this quote, I always assumed that I'm not very close with this person, so um, what the hell. Uh, I don't see their baby photos because I don't know them very well, but actually the person shared their photos with everybody, but the algorithm took the decision to not show the photos to the other user. So these systems that operate um, in a, a hidden, they, uh, they have a very huge impact on uh, interhuman um, relationships. So what do these new systems actually achieve. So, other examples are Netflix or YouTube. If you look at some videos, and four of them are with funny dog puppies, uh, and the algorithm decides to, oh, he likes dog puppies, let's show him more videos of uh, funny puppies. So if I look at ten videos, and in four of them, um, refugees are criminals, then the system will show me more videos of that type, so it will change my worldview. So those filter bubbles and echo chambers, uh, they get created online, but also in real life with your friend group, where certain worldviews are shared, but on the, on the interweb they're more in transparent. So and they're all under the same YouTube logo. So those are problems that we have to solve. And this concludes my part on the human-machine interaction, uh, a field that's affected, uh, concerned with those questions. And I would like to hand over now to Karn, who will focus more on the technical side of things. Yes, hello. So, we've now already shown that algorithms are impacting us already today in our daily lives. And we've seen to what extent uh, this happens once they have been set in place. And we've also seen that they don't necessarily actually deliver what is being put into them in terms of trust. And now we would like to actually show you in what cases this is especially not recommended to trust an algorithm. And what's important here is something that we call bias. There are two, two biases. One is the bias of data, our own values, value judgments, whether or not we know them or not. That's the first category of a bias. And the second one is the bias of the model. So when a population is misrepresented in the data that is the basis of the algorithm, so what engineers build into the algorithm to make the predictions. In this process, the bias of the model can actually reduce the bias of the data. At the same time, it's also possible that the bias of the data is impacting the model bias. And we'll show you now four different examples showcasing a couple of these uh, biases. And machine learning has made a lot of progress in the last years and also respective research has been triggered by the success of artificial intelligence. One of the studies 
of this latest research is elaborating it's done in Shanghai and this research is claiming that you can detect criminals by looking at their passport photo and we will now focus on this because it's uh, contradicting other research findings basically using socio-economic context to predict your potential crime rate and what those researchers have done is they've taken 1800 photos of Chinese citizens 700 of these photos were depicting criminals so people who have have been sentenced for a crime and 1100 photos were randomly selected from the internet from such like LinkedIn and other sources. And let's have a look at a couple of data points to actually see what, what this study dealt with. So here we have six examples, six images. And one row is uh, one row consists of pictures of criminals and one of legally people who have not uh, committed a crime. I would like to now do a vote. Please left or right hand whether you think the top or the bottom row is non-criminal. So most of you probably think that they can identify the ones who have committed a crime. And somehow we think we can predict this by, um, by looking at a couple of data points. For example, um, his uh, shirt or a slight uh, smile and in contrast to this, there might be um, a strong light into, uh, put into your face, like when you're, uh, a picture is being taken in you, uh, from you in prison. And on the other side, there's a makeup or Photoshop even been used to, to tweak your uh, picture used for a resume or an application. So the algorithm is, for example, detecting whether or not uh, Photoshop has been used on a picture. And this is maybe an extreme case of uh, how data is actually impacting the outcome of an algorithm. So that's data bias. Bias can aber auch entstehen ganz zufällig, wenn zu wenige Datenpunkten vorhanden sind, um verlässliche Aussagen zu treffen. So there's a the uh, sample can be uh, screwed, and also the the data can be. Uh, biased by the, by the amount of data that is used to base the algorithm on. And there's also a reporting bias in this case, um, basically when data is being, uh, when and how data is being identified for the algorithm. And also the modeling assumptions are important in this uh, context. So, uh, before the hype, there's been this uh, no free lunch theory. Um, no possible model would uh, would work in that scenario. And so we would have to change our assumptions uh, looking at a specific problem and use uh, limited assumptions. But then, without the model uh, showing that it's not adequate, um, it fails nonetheless, and so it's our job as scientists to um, point out um, these, these cases and uh, to really check whether algorithms uh, are valid in a certain case or not. But so the success so far of uh, machine learning uh, lets us uh, forget these rules quite easily. We tend to think that models are so flexible that um, there are no limits anymore. But um, 
And I want to point out an example that still hasn't changed, even though we've had this deep learning hype. And that's um, goal setting. So what is success? Hendrik already talked about um, mistakes and a correction of mistakes that we need to do to train algorithms. But it's often the case that we don't really know what exactly is a mistake. And that's up to, uh, to the engineer to decide. So for example, on YouTube, uh, they know how how many people, uh, how long people spend on their site, but maybe there's not even a person in the room with the computer, but the computer is still, you know, still has YouTube open. Uh, and also with clicks, it uh, might not uh, necessarily uh, mean that a person likes a certain video. So just imagine we have a data set of translations and we want to measure whether text has been translated correctly. How can we test that. So word by word or paragraph by paragraph. If we use a word for word measure, then you know that doesn't work through too many languages. Then uh, paragraph by paragraph, you know, that might not work as well because maybe the algorithm doesn't have the right context. And then what about synonyms? Like, is that uh, depending on the data set, that might be interpreted differently by the algorithm. And so that means we need to make decisions. At um, Google and uh, other leading translation software companies, um, they uh, translate sentence by sentence. They tend to think of sentences as independent and only the most predictable word uh, gets computed. So back to our example from the beginning. Um, she's a woman, she's, uh, she's a doctor. And then we translate it into Turkish and then back again. Then we get, she's a woman, he's a doctor. And now we see how this happens. The algorithm doesn't know about the context. So he only trans uh, the algorithm only translates the most uh, frequent occurrence. So it's not necessarily bias within the data, but bias within the assumptions that simplify the model we use way too much. And uh, something else, if we change the period to a comma, then the algorithm is suddenly able to correctly translate because it knows about the context. So another example um, of this bias phenomenon, how can bias be um, get bigger over time? Um, we have active learning. That means there's data on this databases we train an algorithm, but we're not quite sure about something, so we ask a human expert. And then there's always the question of, have I uh, correctly treated this data point? And then the algorithm gets more data in the future to learn better and to not have to ask the human being so often. And this works well, but what about a data point that is uh, described um, not correctly described? And then, of course, we have uh, human beings that are not as perfect as we like to think. So we have the assumption of perfect data and a perfect human being in this model, but that leads to this wrong data point being ignored. Um, and so the cause of distortion isn't visible anymore, and that leads to more distortion. And uh, then, of course, if we have more distorted data, then they keep on piling up because there's no... the. The human being assigned to the task uh, doesn't even know about it. And so, of course, uh, Google and Facebook, the big players, don't aren't transparent most of the time, but uh, this might be an example where something like that might have happened. So we have an African-American wom woman, uh, bottom row in the middle, and she's assigned the term gorilla. And of course, uh, this was 
uh, quite huge in the media, but Google didn't quite explain exactly how that happened. So, um, first of all, it might be that uh, the description is always provided by uh, human beings, and they might, you know, just like to troll, but still, uh, that might not be an adequate explanation. Uh, groups of people in our society might be marginalized and um, for those marginalized groups they very often are not included in testing uh, procedures and we can also think of Microsoft's uh, Tay chatbot uh, that uh, was uh, brought very quickly to uh, write racist messages and so um, Transmitting learning. Um, there's an exercise for the algorithm to make it learn, um, but that there's too little data to actually get it to learn. And so we have uh, another kind of exercise to help our original problem with more data. Um, but this again um, leads to a distortion, leads to bias. So, for example, if we have uh, robotic arms, uh, a hall full of robotic arms, a, th a thousand of them, they're not, they're not that good at learning. So, what happens in modern robotics is that you um, have your systems uh, being trained in uh, models. So, that's not reality, but for example, uh, surrounding lights and, uh, of course, the idealized version of a robotic arm, that's, that's not true to reality at all. And so, of course, uh, the future uh, with self-driving cars, uh, more space in cities, um, more fluent traffic, and all the promises that come with that, we can be quite skeptical about that because of course, self-driving cars have been trained mostly in uh, models and not in reality. And so data points, they can be close together or um, can be very much distant from each other. And to find new data points, uh, that is called interpolation. But find data points outside of that frame uh, is called extrapolation and that's not very easy to do and interpolation going from one or more data points to another can answer important questions for example how would uh, the child of Kim Jong-un and Donald J. Trump look like what would uh, that look like uh, also the um, changing uh, video, for example, this is a Photoshop, well, an edited version of a porno with a face of the Wonder Woman actress. And so, of course, you know, there's uh, lots of possibilities. You don't want to think too much about that. And there's cases where we also don't want to make a wrong assumption, uh, but this is really hard uh, when we talk about extrapolation. And modern science still hasn't uh, found the right answers for that. And so what we need to remember is that algorithms make these assumptions and that can even lead to uh, hostile attacks on algorithms. For example, you take a data point from a data set and then you have their um, properties, for example, traffic signs, and then find a very similar data point that the algorithm treats as something completely different. And the spooky thing is that this even works with printed versions of the same attack, even if you don't know the, even if you don't use the same model or the same data set. So if you're interested in that, please stay for the next presentation. Um, in conclusion, I really want to point out that in all systems of modern machine learning, there's uh, an evaluation of correlation going on. It's not about causation. Mathematical um, 
causational reachers, uh, of course, an effect in systems is very much a new field and uh, the description of correlation is just one of the steps necessary for for that. So before we go over to the Q&A session, um, Hendrik and I still want to point something out. We really hope we pointed out the uh, limits of machine learning, uh, but of course that won't um, Keep, uh, keep us as a society from reaping the benefits of this new technology. So um, in uh, bi yeah, medicine, uh, biology, and of course that raises political questions that concern us all. So these aren't decisions that scientists can, should, uh, or must um, make on their own. So who's, uh, who's responsible for making decisions? human beings or machines? Is it about engineers or corporations when uh, who is at fault? And how can we actually um, enforce existing laws uh, when confronted with this new reality of algorithms? And how and why should they be regulated? So thank you very much for your attention and yeah, let's hear some questions. <coughs> Yeah, thank you very much. We're now opening up the round for questions. Please line up at the microphones. Micro one. Thank you very much for the talk. Really interesting. I think this is a really important subject and how we deal with it, uh, especially because it has real impact on politics and mobilization and all those things. Henrik, you mentioned artificial intelligence and its application to, let's say, political propaganda, uh, Cambridge Analytica and so forth. And also, as a second topic, the filter bubbles that you mentioned. And I'm interested in especially one question in the context of Brexit and the Trump election. What are the possibilities, the options that are there to actually oppose and counter that opinions are being echoed and even strengthened through the uh, phenomena that you mentioned, uh, AI and big data? So do you have any concrete suggestions to, to counter those developments? Thanks very much for the question. Um, so uh, that's about how, how do we tackle these problems in the political sphere. And this is a huge question and I feel like uh, it's going to stay with us for quite a while. So uh, with our friends and in, in corporations um, when we get together, for me it's about how can we uh, support people, how can we visualize algorithms, how can we make people understand what happens there. Um, and our perspective is how can we, you know, open up this black box and uh, how can the system show how s secure it really is. And that's a lot of work. Uh, for example, there's the fairness, accountability, transparency, machine learning. Uh, there's a huge group of people uh, from all sorts of um, backgrounds in uh, psychology, sociology, and of course computer sciences uh, that uh, deal with these kinds of questions. Uh, please leave the room as quietly as possible and try to keep using the right door. Microphone 5, please. Well, I'd rather have a short comment. Um, in machine learning, what we've seen with regard to the gorilla example, and other, isn't this an example of the cost function? Be since, since we've said the algorithm, it's as expensive to take the class of uh, gorilla and the class of human, it's, it's as costly as 
as mixing up also other words. Doesn't need this need to be differentiated a bit more? Good point. Of course, you you know you can uh, defend against that sort of thing uh, and say, you know, this is worse than that. Um, for example, with Google Photos, where we want to have all these categories, it's also, uh, you know, uh, a task for human beings. It's not just about machine learning. And a problem with this bias, uh, and that was what it was about, is, uh, yeah, more, more complex. And it's not just about this cost function. Yeah, and the point was also about, you know, there must have been a wrong data point, and then how this uh, bias was calculated in some sort of uh, negative spiral um, when the algorithm looks at that. And maybe that's, uh, you know, uh, too much simplification going on of uh, reality. And of course, uh, these are really... Um, easy examples to illustrate this here and of course there's always blind spots um, and this might be one as well because uh, Google might not be diverse enough and they didn't uh, test uh, their photo algorithm on enough data points before they made it public microphone one thank you very much I think this is a great approach of putting this topic on the agenda making it more popular you talked a lot about bias, and very often when talking about bias, it's about neutral and, and uh, judgment. And you also mentioned machine learning in that context. And in this context, in, within, with regard to political debates, bias and screwing, is that actually the right term to describe political phenomena, or should this be maybe described differently with a different term? So, you know, we're not uh, all about communications. Um, that's not our expertise. Um, there's people that can do that a lot better uh, than us, but, uh, you know, people like us, we, we're doing a PhD uh, within this field as computer scientists, um, how we can deal with uh, these problems. Uh, but that's, yeah, it's going to be a long-term task to uh, really get this out uh, onto the street. There's a question from the IRC. Is human learning not comparable to machine learning, aren't the challenges the same or are they different? <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want to do this? Uh, well, it's a question, it's not just about machine learning, it's also about uh, evolutionary uh, theory and uh, psychology and I don't know too much about that, but the idea behind machine learning is to um, find mistakes, communicate them, and then adjust and correct the model. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's the case for us humans as well. So, in the sense that, you know, our brain is optimized over time, I feel like I've heard psychologists deny that. So, the problem with this question isn't necessarily, you know, how does machine learning work, but it's how do we ourselves work. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. And the models of machine learning are very, very rough estimations of how we ourselves work. And so there's, you know, back then there was uh, the thought of, you know, the body as a machine. Um, and now we have these... Uh, neural networks and I feel like and that's the model we apply to uh, think of uh, ourselves um, so I feel like there's always some adjustment going on um, and I feel like for us as human beings all the assumptions we make all the stereotypes uh, that exist um, they might be useful from time to time but uh, in totality um, they, they don't apply all the time so that might be the case for machines and for humans. Microphone 4. Maybe a bit naive, um, but is there, are there metrics? 
with regard to the bias that we see every day in the net. Are there techniques to visualize those kind of biases, to make it known, so people realize that this is a highly complex topic? And I'm looking for ways of this complex topic being visualized so people know and get aware of those statistical problems. Oh, there's research for this. There's the MIT Media Lab that deal with this sort of thing. Um, they have examples of individual people, you know, what sort of gender bias they have for the people they follow on Twitter. For example, they only follow uh, males. Um, so that's part of the puzzle, but this sort of media education that has to be taken seriously. If we want to use all these algorithms, if we want to drive around in self-driving cars, we really have to uh, take this seriously. There's always blind spots and uh, up front it's not possible to uh, take all of those into account. And for some more context regarding this question from uh, algorithmic science point of view, um, for us we don't have a, you know, we don't distinguish between positive and negative distortion. Uh, for us, there's just um, properties that um, let us draw conclusions. And when we say that we have certain values that are just uh, proxies for uh, different data sets. For example, where I live is often a proxy for where I am from or uh, other data points. And so, if I know what sort of data points shouldn't are sensitive and shouldn't be uh, taken into account to draw further conclusions, um, then I can uh, feed this into uh, into an algorithm and have the dein Bildungsstatus oder dein Einkommen, dass die keine Rolle spielen. Result computed from that, so der Algorithmus Voraussagen macht. So to actually see how the algorithm makes predictions. What I'm really interested in is not the distinction between good and bad, but rather a visualization of data sets and those results. For example, that one is based on a very s small num number of data points and others are based on a high number of data points. And this, I think, I'm looking for visualizations of such cases. Yeah, there are cases like that um, and we can measure that, but it's always uh, sort of, you know, simplification. It's always... Uh, uh, the question of how easy can we make it, how much can we simplify it. There's this core approach, um, and that's not about how do I have to think about my hypotheses when I look at the data, but it's more about how good is my data uh, for my hypotheses. So, and this approach uh, allows us to make different uh, statements. So, for example, if I have a, an outlier data point, then that changes, that changes the statement I can make. And then I have to be uh, upfront about it and say that this is a very vague guess. Um, but in the, re yeah, the research for that is still sort of uh, uh, doing baby steps. Microphone one, please. Thank you very much for this talk, and also thank you very much for mutually translating this uh, ongoingly, on a constant basis. I'm interested in your take on how useful those approaches are to take milestones and evaluate the opportunities that, that those approaches, machine learning and so forth, actually yield for society. 
Also das ist eigentlich das genau das, worauf wir hinaus wollten. Ja, yeah, that's that's uh, what we wanted to get at. It's a political question and we don't want to answer that yeah. or uh, yeah. uh, a question for the law. So it's it's about society dealing with this, getting together and finding answers. Yeah, I know, but once you've defined a milestone, a separation between good and bad, and you look at the data points on one and the other side, um, and if you look at those data points and, and uh, some are actually relevant and others are not, let's say we have a point X, a milestone with a certain quality criteria attached. Like a car doesn't kill more humans than a human driver. And are there, is there something like values grouped around this, this boundary that, that you can draw conclusions from? Or are all those points scattered around the decision uh, horizon? I think it's problematic to sort of focus on this point because it's uh, about a lot more uh, environmental factors and then just take this one singular point and uh, draw conclusions from that, that's probably too simplistic and I once again want to point out the political question. And self-driving cars, you know, they, they can never um, test cr crashes, at least not with uh, humans, so these crash scenarios are only ever tested in simulations. And that exactly is the problem uh, that we have today, at least as far as I know. We have very few scenarios where we have uh, training uh, in certain uh, model scenarios. What assumptions do we can we actually transfer into the real world? And so even even really pointing out these assumptions is very hard for us today, and so it's still uh, quite a long way to go. Thank you very much. Microphone one. Thank you again for the talk. The discussion connected to all of this is actually how can we find truth and how can we make a computer to find truth? We have the same in science, like how do I design my sample? Is there a bias in the sample? Have you ever dealt with this parallelism? So we're scientists, and of course we have to know for ourselves um, what we found out. You know, yesterday there was this talk, science is broken. Um, so it's always quite hard to have the right sample size and to think of the effect size. And this is an epistemological question. Aren't there kind of values you can orientate yourself to uh, with regard to neural nets, uh, uh, networks or something? Um, are there any values you can rely on with regard to layers or parameters? Uh, well, this question is maybe uh, it goes into, you know, uh, early 90s, uh, early neural networks, Baltimore machines, Hoffman networks, stuff like that. Uh, for these, we can say that when they're saturated, uh, how many bits of data uh, were put into that system. But for the non-linear systems that we use today, uh, it's not possible to say that anymore. It's just... Uh, uh, an estimation, it's not uh, an exact uh, size. But can't you say you need a certain amount of data points to saturate your system and uh, therefore we need a sort of pre-validation um, approach? Yeah, but that's what happens. You have this uh, huge data set, uh, another data set, and a training or evaluation data set. So uh, where you really have to check, uh, did we actually learn something or did we just like learn to repeat our uh, input data set? Yeah, so, uh, but this is still a PhD a dissertation Microphone waiting to be five. written. Yeah. 
uh, these biases are not new. Like we've known them for decades in statistics. What has now actually changed with artificial intelligence? And in this context, do you know any studies that filter bubbles really have an impact that you can also measure? I've heard a lot about it in the media, but I've never come across any scientific study that has shown that you are actually uh, uh, strengthening and making something stronger that hasn't been there before. <laughs> uh, I forgot the first question. Please repeat it. Uh, sure. What has changed w with the biases in machine learning? All right. Uh, no, of course, that's not new. And the... Uh, uh, assumptions are new as well. So we have uh, great, you know, data science is uh, hyped right now at universities, but um, now people go ahead and throw stuff into their systems, uh, maybe to make money, but don't really think about these problems at all. And regarding the second question, I'm pretty sure there's a lot on echo chambers out there. Um, I'm not sure what you asked exactly whether it was possible to test this scientifically, uh, how a, you know an approach to testing this uh, would work. But I'm pretty sure there's uh, lots of literature on echo chambers, but I can't think of a offer right now. Thank you very much for the talk again. Um, I see that there are more questions. Um, Please approach the speakers right after with your questions. Thank you very much, everyone.